Leader of the Opposition and Tanya Plibersek, our Shadow Minister for Education, back into my electorate of Swan in my community. So thank you all. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here at a great Catholic primary school, doing great things for the kids and uh, doing a great job, actually, for Australia. Now, Tanya and I and Mark Butler are here visiting with Hannah, and we're pleased to say that a Labor government, if it gets elected on May the 18th, is going to invest a billion dollars to help make our schools solar schools. 4,000 schools will benefit from an upgrade or indeed the introduction of new technology to get their power bills down and to also make sure we're doing more on climate change. These are very sensible proposals which are going to help schools with the cost of living challenges, which are going to help uh, provide power into the grid and mean that we can do something proper on climate change. In terms of where we go in this, what, the government's, what we will do as the government is that we will work with both government and non-government schools to roll out this program. What I'd like to do now is to ask Tanya uh, to talk further about this program and also Mark Butler. Well, thanks very much, Bill, and it is such a delight to visit this lovely school. <coughs> and uh, I, I will let Mark uh, answer some questions in more detail about the new school, solar schools program. But I wanted to make an additional <coughs> announcement today that uh, Labor would invest almost $21 million extra into TAFE facilities here in Western Australia. Um, we've got uh, uh, so, um, so many fantastic projects uh, before us in this new TAFE investment plan, including, for example, $10 million towards a new state-of-the-art TAFE facility in Armidale that would be matched by the uh, Western Australian Government, so it would be a beautiful new TAFE there. Almost $5 million for three new NDIS and aged care training uh, centres at Joondalup, Mount Lawley and Rockingham and $3 million for a new Metronet training facility at Midland TAFE. Obviously, um, Metronet will be a huge job generator here in the West. Uh, we're expecting about 10,000 extra jobs. And having the new training facilities uh, at that TAFE uh, into um, engineering, uh, um, uh, metal fabrication and the jobs that will be required from the build of the Metronet uh, is really important. Um, the Solar Schools program is a very exciting program. We made sure that uh, about half of Australian schools had solar panels when we were last in government, but this is a significant step up from that last program. Um, obviously, the technology is uh, much better than it was when uh, we rolled out those initial schools with uh, solar panels on their roofs. But even schools that had those earlier panels, like this school here, uh, talk about the savings that they're already making on their electricity bills. Now that panels are cheaper uh, and more efficient, you'll see even greater savings. But the exciting thing about the program that we're announcing today is that it's not just panels on the roofs, it's batteries so that the power can be stored for the use of the school, uh, or in periods where the school's not using the power, it can be sold back into a virtual power network. It can power homes and businesses in the local community. That means that the school can even uh, not just reduce its own power bills, but potentially make money from the power that it's selling back into the grid. When you think about the number of days that schools are not using a lot of power, particularly during the Christmas holidays, particularly on the weekends, you see that they are peak times for domestic power use. So the school's not using the power, but uh, the power can be sold back into the grid for um, homes that are using the air conditioning a little bit more over the summer holidays or using the, you know, the... Uh, got the telly on a little bit more uh, during the weekend and the summer holidays. Um, this is a, an absolutely win-win situation for schools, uh, but also it provides reliability and stability in the power grid too. Are there any questions about this or any other matters? Uh, on, on your climate change policy, you've said that there's some possible price. You've also quoted research saying that it would be the same and 
and they could have taken into account the cost of climate change, which you said is $18 billion. You've, you've quoted a figure on that as well. All right, I think I understand your question. It's about the cost of climate change and the cost of our policies. I've got Mark Butler here today as well, which as a little aside, I've got my climate change minister with me. We're in Western Australia. I don't think, you know, a little Price, you know, I can get Melissa Price photograph with Scott Morrison while they're over here talking about climate. But that's just the small part. The big picture is, as we heard last night in the debate, this government has got every excuse in the book not to take action on climate change. Climate change is real. Climate change is extracting a big cost, as you said correctly, Greg. It's estimated $18 billion a year in natural disasters, and some of that is obviously due to more extreme weather events and climate. What, sorry, Greg, I'm going, to, I'm going to do you the courtesy of your three-point question to get I and Mark to answer it, if you will uh, let me. Now, on the cost of climate change, we think there is a big cost. You and I know that this government's going down every rabbit hole, down every burrow, on every sideshow to avoid one fact. They don't have a climate policy, do they? I mean, if they were going to have a climate policy, which was serious, Malcolm Turnbull would still be Prime Minister. But you talk about modelling, why don't I get Mark to talk about the plethora of material which is already there? Mark. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Greg, for your question. Um, the PBO would not have modelled the safeguards mechanism for us any more than it's modelled the safeguards mechanism for Malcolm Turnbull, who introduced the mechanism, and Scott Morrison, for whom it's continuing as a part of their policy mix. We, of course, we of course have had the Clean Energy Finance Corporation policy, which is underpinning this amazing program we're announcing today, costed by the uh, Parliamentary Budget Office. But if I can go to the, the point about the cost impact of the policy we've announced. It is impossible to, to cost this because a Labor government led by Bill Shorten and Tanya Plibersek would not be imposing a direct carbon price on businesses. It certainly would not be imposing a carbon tax any more than Malcolm Turnbull or Scott Morrison have because what we've decided to do after talking exhaustively with business groups over the last 12 or 18 months is simply adopt the safeguards mechanism that was introduced by Malcolm Turnbull. Now, all that mechanism does is set a limit on carbon pollution. If businesses are able to stick to their limit, then they won't hear from the government any more. They're obviously required to report on those limits, but other than that, there is no price impact at all. And if they're not able to stick to their limit in the same way that they're not under the safeguards mechanism as it operates now, they'll have the broadest possible range of offsets. But how business deals with that is going to be a matter for them. It won't be dictated by Canberra, so it can't be costed by Canberra. It will be a matter for them, and that is what business unanimously has asked the Labor Party to adopt as our policy. Now, if I can go to the broader macroeconomic impact, because this is something that your paper has written a fair bit about, uh, we've only seen over the last week or two, again, Citibank, uh, a bank very, very expert in, in um, analysis about climate and energy policy, uh, declare over the last several days that the impact of Labor's policy would be immaterial, even on those businesses impacted by the policy, let alone the broader economy. Uh, Warwick McKibben, who was commissioned by the Abbott government to conduct macroeconomic modelling of the 26 per cent target and the 45 per cent target, uh, found then that the Labor policy and the Liberal policy, remembering that the Labor policy includes international trading, would have no different impact whatsoever. The impact on the economy would be exactly the same, which would be that the economy over the course of the decade would grow in real terms by about 23 per cent. Now that was back in 2015, but Warwick McKibben has written in the Financial Review only in recent days reaffirming that policy, with one exception, which is to say he thinks the cost of emissions reduction will actually be lower than he thought in 2015 because of the extraordinary technological improvements that have been made in the energy sector. Well, first of all, we think childcare is a unique sector. So the model in which we're going to finally sort out the underpayment of early childhood educators is a model, a template which we will only use in childcare. In terms of the first industry to see wages move, we have other mechanisms to help other industries. Like I make no apology for the fact that I want to reverse the penalty rate cuts, which have seen, as the McKell Institute says, if they're not reversed, $2.8 billion of pay taken out of the pockets of hundreds of thousands of low-paid workers in restaurants, in accommodation, in pharmacy. So we've got a range of different strategies, but for early childhood educators, it almost this, this government is so mean-spirited. Mr Morrison must have a very warped view 
of how you treat underpayment of workers in childcare, to rule it out, to say we won't fix childcare unless everyone else gets an identical pay rise. Well, this is just absurd. The fact of the matter is, and you may be aware, that if you look at 96 occupational categories in Australia, childcare comes in at the 92nd lowest pay. 92nd. And it's no coincidence, in my opinion, that it's an industry predominantly uh, populated by women. In other words, 96% of the workforce are women. So when you join the dots, uh, a feminised industry, underpaid, early childhood education, underpaid. We've come up with a plan to help early childhood educators. I mean, the, the, the sort of the poverty of Mr Morrison's wages policy, we heard in the debate last night, where when he was asked about wages, he started talking about emissions reduction, you know, join those dots for me. But the point about it is, he doesn't have a plan for people's wages. And, what he, and the only answer that his poor old Minister Birmingham gave today or last night about early childhood educators is that get the providers to pay them more. Well, that's a great plan, Simon, because the providers will make parents pay more. So Mr Birmingham's only plan to help early childhood educators is to make parents pay. We don't have that plan. We've come up with, I think, a special solution to deal. And it, it, you don't have to take my word for it. Ask all the parents to send their kids to childcare. Sure, sure, sure. It's your turn. Will you, will you review the RBA's target rate for inflation if you win the election? Well, we think that the RBA should be independent in terms of its setting of monetary policy. The RBA has said that it uh, likes to see inflation between 2 and 3 per cent. I think the bigger problem, uh, the bigger challenge for me, isn't what the RBA says inflation should be. It's the fact that in the last quarter inflation was 0 per cent. Can I tell you? That's the equivalent of the alarm going off in the fire station. When you've got 0% inflation, that means people aren't spending money. The reason why people are not spending money is under this government they're unconfident. And one of the reasons they're unconfident is we see cuts to schools and hospitals. We also see wage stagnation. You know, Mr Morrison loves to talk about a strong economy, but a strong economy for exactly who? The reality is that there's one million Australians who've got to hold down two jobs to make ends meet. There's one million Australians plus who every month say they'd like more work. The reality is that we've seen prices going up, cost of living, childcare, healthcare, energy prices. This economy is not working in the interests of middle and working class people. Under Mr Morrison, it's never been a better time to be a high priced CEO or a multinational in Australia. Under Mr Morrison, it's never been a worse time to be a middle class wage earner in this country. Mr Shorten, you've just described the, uh, the recent inflation number, unless I'm wrong, as alarming. Uh, I think that was I'm, the metaphor but, I used. Well, well to tell me if I'm taking you out of context here, because I wanted to get a sense of how much peril you believe the Australian economy is well, in when inflation is flatlining. Just how bad is it? I think this government's economic record is pretty bloody hopeless. Let's just call it as it is. And but I'll just, economy... Timmy, let me answer your question you've asked. First of all, let's go to some key numbers. Under this government, debt's gone up. Debt has uh, doubled under this government. That's a problem because if interest rates go up, all of a sudden Australians will be stuck with paying bigger interest rate payments on a government's national debt that they've run up. We've got the problem of underemployment. We've got the problem of wages stagnation. Now you see zero percent inflation. This economy is not operating in the interests of working people. What we've got is a government with a very threadbare policy offering. You all saw, well hopefully you all saw the debate last night. What we saw is two contrasting policies. We've got a positive vision for the future. We understand that if you invest in education, you're going to get a productive workforce in the future. We understand that if you aim for the world's best healthcare system, you can have healthier Australians. We understand that when you take, an, when you take on cost of living and don't just leave it, uh, that what we do is we'll see res wage restraint or price restraint in childcare, private health insurance. More renewables will ultimately mean lower prices. We're the only party with a wages policy and we want to take real action on climate change. By contrast, what did Mr Morrison offer viewers watching last night? His only argument for re-election is that he's not Labor. I mean, his only argument is a very threadbare... It's a, you and I know this is the most threadbare policy offering in a century of Australian elections. They just basically say it'll trickle down. If we look after the top 10 per cent, the top 5 per cent, maybe you'll get more tips on your plate uh, when you go out to lunch. Uh, well, they say that uh, they're going to give you tax cuts in five years' times, but do they explain to you where the money's coming from? They're promising you unfunded tax plans on the never-never, 
which can only be delivered if there are cuts to hospitals and services, and they're promising business as usual. That's not good enough for Australia. The Australian people need a government worthy of the people. Mr Short, so, I can ask you your reaction to Steve Dixon resigning from One Nation um, over the street <clears throat> pub incident? Oh, he should have. His comments were appalling. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Appalling. Uh, should have resigned. But it just, I think, highlights the bigger problem that this desperate Morrison government has. No wonder they're cranky in their public presentation at the moment. They realise that they've pulled the wrong reins. They've uh, made as their key allies Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party and Clive Palmer. You know, no, this is chaotic. Imagine if Mr Morrison sneaks home at the election courtesy of Pauline Hanson's One Nation and Clive Palmer. Imagine if we have a country, if you vote Liberal or One Nation or Palmer United Party, and you have Clive Palmer and Pauline Hanson calling the shots to the government. I mean, does anyone seriously believe that Clive Palmer and Pauline Hanson just give their preferences to Mr Morrison without there being an IOU on the other side of the election? I promise you this. A vote for Morrison is a vote for Hanson and Palmer, and it's a vote for chaos, chaos, chaos. Yeah. I think that aged care workers are underpaid, but we've got a Royal Commission underway. Let's see what the Royal Commission produces in the way of it. I want to pay a compliment to our aged care workers. They do a lot of work with a lot of vulnerable people. Uh, I think that we need to invest more in aged care generally. But I think let's have the Royal Commission. The solution that we've looked at for early childhood educators is a recognition that nothing else has worked. They are underpaid, they're highly trained and that it's long overdue that we do the right thing. Sorry, you're next. Child care workers will get the pay increase. Will it be all of them? Well, our plan is that all child care workers would see an improvement in their wages. Sure, just, on, just on the economy and interest rates, if the Reserve Bank decides to uh, reduce interest rates next month, uh, so the, uh, the rate reduction during the height of an election campaign, what do you think that that says about the economy? Well, first of all, the RBA has got to make its decisions independent of government pressure. So the decision they make, I'm not going to start putting pressure on them. I think, though, that if they felt they had to do that, that's not a reflection on the Reserve Bank, but it is a reflection on the Australian government, isn't it? This is a government who's you know, boasted about their strong economic management, but the fact that uh, we're even talking about an interest rate cut shows the anemic weakness in the current government's economic management. What this nation needs is we need to make sure that we're not just relying on our mineral exports, as important as they are, to prop up our economy. We need to go back to the fundamentals. Let's invest in people, let's invest in infrastructure. You know, let's invest in our human capital and let's invest in our physical infrastructure. We've got a plan, for example, in Western Australia to invest in Metronet. We've got a plan to make sure in Victoria or in Queensland we invest in key public transport and, of course, the Bruce Highway and you name it. We've been looking at infrastructure. That's good. That's more productivity. We want to upgrade our ports and upgrade our airports. But our other part of our economic growth plan is to invest in people. The beauty of what Labor is suggesting, the vision under our plan, which we're trusting the Australian people with by telling them what we're going to do, as we should. So imagine if we're a country where every three- and four-year-old actually gets kindergarten. 15 hours a week, 40 weeks of the year. That just means they get the best start in life. That's world's best practice. It's only just good enough for Australia. Imagine if we're a country who puts back the $14 billion that the current government promised for public schools, but never did. Imagine if every kid can go to a school, regardless of their postcode, regardless of the wealth of their parents, the size of the school, get a quality education. Imagine if you're a parent of a child with a disability and you don't get treated like a bully merely because you demand for a fair go for your child. Imagine if we have. 200,000 more people going to university in the next 10 years. Imagine if we can restore the 150,000 apprenticeships which have, and traineeships which have disappeared under the current government. Why don't we in this country have a debate about how can we be the best in the world? Imagine if a million Australian households actually get real help, $1,000, $1,500, $2,000 a year to help with their childcare subsidies. And imagine if we're a country who doesn't desert our pensioners. Three million people are on the Commonwealth Health Seniors Card or indeed on a pension, full or part. Imagine if we as a country decide that we're going to invest in the dental health of our older Australians. That's the sort of country which will grow into the future and where we see the fair go, not just for the top, but for everyone. Sorry, you were next. I've given you a go. Sorry. Miranda? On, on religious freedom, what do you say uh, 
um, schools like this one about your promise to amend the Sex Discrimination Act to stop them from choosing the teachers of religious faith that they want to? And also, what do you say to um, Mr Morrison about that issue? Well, Miranda, I, I know you've uh, followed this issue extensively, so I thank you for your work in this topic. For me, I've never been uh, one who's been sectarian. And I think if you spoke to the uh, Catholic Education Commissions around Australia, they would agree that Tanya and I have been very good to work with. And so where that leaves your question is this. We don't think you should discriminate against people because of their sexuality. And I don't think most people do. And most people in the church accept that they've been working through these issues and it's, it's working okay. But I also respect the right of parents to send their children to a school uh, based upon the faith and the values taught in it. We will work through every issue. We will work through every issue. When I spoke to bishops and leaders of churches, they agree they don't want to see little children discriminated against. We will work through these issues. What I don't want to see is religion becoming a political football. That is why Labor led the case to make sure that uh, the Catholic and low-fee Christian schools got their funding restored. My problem is, of course, that the government hasn't followed through with government schools. We'll work through this, Miranda, because I understand in Australia that it's not a question of majorities dictating to minorities. This country works best when we work together. Do we need a religious discrimination act in Australia? Uh, I'm not sure we do, but having said that, we will always keep talking to people about it. I don't think anyone should be persecuted because of their faith. Uh, but what I do also think is that if we're going to talk about priorities in this country, three million Aussie pensioners don't need to be forgotten in this election. Do you know the number of times I walk around the, in the community and the pensioners come up? These aren't people with a million dollars in you know, shares and getting all the frank, franking credits for not paying tax. I'm talking about three million battlers. And so many elections, people have said, what's in it for the pensioner? Now, I know Mr Morrison says he indexes it every you know, six months. Well, every government does that. That's like giving yourself a medal for getting up in the morning. The real issue is, what are we going to do extra for pensioners? And I'm making it very clear, just as I've said this is election is a referendum on wages, just because this, uh, this election needs to be about real change in climate, this election also needs to be about you know, cost of living and childcare, this election needs to be about our pensioners. And I and my United team, we're not going all the antics that Palmer, Hanson et al. We've been doing the homework over the last six years, and because of our economic reforms, I can promise every pensioner in Australia, pensioners worried about their oral hygiene, their health, the cleaning, the cost, looking after their teeth. If you vote Labor at this election, we'll make sure in Medicare you've got up to $1,000 every two years for the rest of your life to make sure that you can have at least a fair go at having uh, proper dental hygiene. Thanks everybody, we'll see you at the next gig.